It's um, my great pleasure this afternoon to introduce our second speaker in the Network Ed series, Professor John Norton. John Norton's a, a man of many hats, probably literally as well, I think. But amongst other things, he's been at the Open University since uh, 1972 and is the Professor of Public Understanding of Science there. Um, in addition, John is director of a Wolfson College Press Fellowship Program, which is very, very uh, appropriate indeed, because amongst other things, John is also a well-known and active journalist. I'm sure many of you will know his uh, Observer column, and if you don't, I would uh, thoroughly recommend it. And as well as writing for the conventional media, John is a, a very, very active blogger. And his blog, MX 1.1, is one of my favourites. And it's right up with um, Scripting News and OLD Daily and one or two others, which I try not to miss. It's a really great mixture of um, technology speculation, journalism, current affairs, photography, and a bit of Irish culture and politics chucked in as well. So what's there not to like about it? It, it really is good. Anyway, uh, today John is going to be talking about uh, what we really need to know about the internet. But before he starts, I'd just like to say something brief about the technology we're using. As a sort of side element of this seminar series, we're experimenting with lots and lots of different, very lightweight technologies, which we believe potentially could have a use within the school. We had a problem half an hour ago where we were going to use one form of streaming, but the, the laptop broke, so it's not possible. So what you're seeing today is a stream of the event which is just coming from an iPad sitting on top of that cupboard at the back of the room, and that iPad is being used to stream and to capture this event. It's going over the network as well, um, so it's not even hardwired. And uh, if it works, it's a demonstration of a very simple, lightweight technology which we could set up virtually any time and anywhere. Underneath, uh, people are, are using Twitter to join in the discussion. So we just have a simple web page with our iPad streaming over network and Twitter tweeting away underneath where people uh, can join in. And there, just on time, we, we've got another one coming in. It all, is all a bit uh, flaky and experimental, so it might go wrong, but it, it doesn't really matter. It, it's very much a demonstration. And it will, of course, be available as an archive after the event. There is, as I'm sure you know, another speaker in the school this afternoon who um, may be hogging the bandwidth as well a little bit. And uh, I was sort of thinking over lunch that uh, wouldn't it be interesting if uh, the two feeds kind of got mixed up. So John's wide, wise words about the internet were then credited to Bill Gates. And if that were to happen, who knows what the future might be. It might be totally different <laughs> for the internet. Um, and on that thought, I'm going to hand over to John, who's going to talk about what people really need to know about the internet. Thank you. So thank you very much for coming. The basic spur for this invitation, I think, was the fact that uh, a new book by me is, is coming out. But this is not a traditional book-selling uh, talk. Uh, I, of course, I'd be very pleased if you read my book, but, but it's not uh, an obligation. And if you go to my blog, you'll find that the essence of it is available um, for free. I hope my publishers don't find that that impacts on sales, but there you go. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like to talk about the background, what made me... Sorry, I'm just dimming the lights a little okay. on the screen. No, anybody see a light switch? <laughs> Thank you. The thing that's lovely about the LSE is that it is, after all, a great social science institution uh, and has trouble with technology. There you go. <laughs> lovely. Thank you. Thank you. If we can't crack lights, what hope is there for us? Well, some physicists have a problem with that, too, in terms of the speed. Okay, right. Um, some background. Um, the, the thing that started me off on this track was uh, years ago I wrote uh, a history of the internet um, called A Brief History of the Future. And, um, and so I've been thinking about this stuff for a long time. And in recent years, one thing struck me very forcibly, which is that somehow we had made a transition from regarding the internet as something that was kind of exotic and weird, truly weird. Um, and remember, I was in on this stuff very early on, so I experienced the, 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 the weirdness of it personally. Um, 
And it went somehow seamlessly from being that to being something that's mundane, like plumbing, <coughs> mains electricity or whatever. And one of the things that was irritating me as a professional observer of this, of this stuff is that I couldn't, for the life of me, tell you when the moment of transition happened. Was it when, when Ryanair started, for example, because you know that you couldn't book a ticket on Ryanair, basically, unless you used the, the web? Or when did it happen? How, how did this happen? That we went from something where the, the, the internet used to be regarded as being completely weird, uh, and now it's, it's regarded as being very mundane. And in both cases, our society wasn't that interested in it, actually, and certainly wasn't that interested in understanding it. Um, when I say weird, and I, I really mean weird, I, I had a conversation in 1995, I think, with the editor of a major British newspaper. And he said to me, did I not think that this internet stuff was just the, and his phrase was the CB radio de nos jours. In other words, passing fad of no interest. Um, and that was, that was the kind of general mindset in the, of, of, the, of the kind of thinking of, of the thought leaders, so, so, so called, in, in our societies in, in the early 1990s. Um, and nowadays, everybody, it's, it's, it's really taken for granted, and we'd really, we'd really notice it if it, if it didn't exist. Um, so we made that transition. But it had, it had one, one implication, really, which was that we have become actually totally dependent uh, on a network that almost nobody understands, <laughs> and that very few people are actually curious about. Um, and that was the wellspring for thinking about, about writing a book. Now, the consequences of, of this are actually quite serious. Um, for example, we have clueless lawmaking in relation to this stuff, in relation to cyberspace. And I mean clueless. I mean Peter Mandelson style clueless. Um, we have nearly two billion users of this network across the world now. That's a third of the world's population. And most of whom are actually being hoodwinked in one way or another by the services they use. We have what Manuel Castell has wonderfully called on the part of policymakers and called thought leaders uh, and, and other important people in our society, what Manuel called informed bewilderment. In other words, groups of people, opinion formers, legislators, think tanks or whatever, um, who are not short of data or information about the network and its implications. But actually their problem is they have no idea what that means. Um, we have, uh, we have comprehensive surveillance now of everything that happens on the net. We have seen a vaporization of the notion of privacy, and so on, and so on, and so on. And in my opinion, th this is worrying stuff, first of all, and secondly, it stems partly from ignorance and lack of curiosity. So I remember sitting down one day and saying, OK, what would people really need to know? in order to have a rounded appreciation of the internet and its implications. In other words, what, what would you need to know to be an informed citizen in this area? And my answer to that question after some reflection was that actually you need to understand a smallish number of big ideas. The question then was how many ideas? And at that point I remembered famous article in the psychological literature by George Miller, the magical number seven plus or minus two. Um, it was actually a review article. George Miller reviewed all the experimental literature up to that point that had been done on human short-term memory. And his, his judgment was that what the experimental evidence showed up to that point was that humans can basically, on average, handle about seven ideas at any one time. Um, some of those who are, who are cognitively challenged can maybe only manage five, and other people can manage nine, but basically that it came out as seven plus or minus two. And George Miller thought, having published the article, that he'd hear no more about this, but of course he wrote, wrote later that he had spent the rest of his life being persecuted by a number, because the mass media can understand only, the, only small amounts, they can only understand the very limited and simple ideas, but one of the things they did get was that the magical number seven. So from then on, George Miller was persecuted because of this article he once wrote. But actually, it's very appropriate. And I thought, this is, this is a really good place to start. Um, and it gave me the idea of, having, of, of picking out nine big ideas that, if you understand them, would be really helpful in reaching a rounded appreciation of the internet and its implications. And if I added to that a prologue and an epilogue, the formula gave me uh, a book called 
with the title Gutenberg from Gutenberg to Zuckerberg or G2Z. And that's, so that's the background to, to, to what I did. What are these ideas? The first one is that we need to do something that almost nobody does at the moment in relation to this stuff, and that is take the long view. Um, what, we, what, we, what we do instead, and this is partly a problem of the mass media, I think, uh, is we are constantly extrapolating from tiny but sensational developments into the future and saying, what does this mean? So, for example, the contemporary obsession with Facebook, which uh, has displaced the previously contemporary obsession with Google, uh, and before that with Microsoft and so on and so forth, uh, and with Twitter. Okay. Um, and so you have this constant kind of obsession with, with major phenomena um, without actually seeing them in any kind of context. I have a friend who's a very distinguished and senior librarian in the United States, and he has dealt extensively with the two co-founders of Google. Um, and the particular project he, he worked with them on was the Google Books project, which many of you know about. And at one point, they, the two boys castigated him for his um, kind of apparent lack of enthusiasm for their great ideas. Uh, and he said, look, what's worrying me, boys, is uh, what re what's really worrying me is what happens when, when Google isn't around anymore. And he said he'd never seen two people more shocked. The idea that Google might not exist in 50 years' time, or even in 25 years' time, had never crossed their tiny minds. But the number of commercial companies that have existed for more than 100 years is pretty small. Okay. Now, that's what I mean about the, the, our obsession with the present and, and so on. So the first idea in the book was, if you want to really think intelligently about the net, I think you have to try and see it in a wider context. And at that point, thinking about, thinking about it, and the reason for that is obvious. We're, we're in the middle of a revolutionary transformation in our communications environment. And when you're living through a revolution, it is actually very hard to make sense of it. Think of living through the, the, the October Revolution in the, in the Soviet Union. Could you think of living through what was happening in Cairo a few months ago? Um, could you make sense of it then? Can you make sense of it now? We don't know. Um, but we're lucky in one respect, because we have once before, as a, as a species, we have once before lived through a massive transformation of our communications environment. And the guy responsible for it was a geek called Johannes Gutenberg. And I started with that and think, OK, what could we learn from print? Um, because printing, as a technology, transformed and shaped the world for the next 400 years. Um, but in order to get people to appreciate the connection, I thought of a thought experiment. So, and I'll ask you to do it with me. We know that we can date the, Gutenberg, the first Gutenberg Bibles, the first things that rolled off his, his, his press, uh, in, as to 1455. Um, now, here's the thought experiment. You're a Maury pollster, you're a medieval Maury pollster. You're sampling public opinion in medieval Europe. You're standing on the bridge in Mainz in Germany, which is where Gutenberg had his printing press, in 1473. And you've got a clip slate. And you're stopping people and saying, do you mind if I ask you a few questions? And here's question four. On a scale of one to five, where one means definitely yes, and five means definitely no. Do you think that the inventing of printing by movable type will, A, undermine the authority of the Catholic Church, B, trigger and fuel and enable the Protestant Reformation, C, enable the rise of modern science, D, create whole new social classes and occupations, E, transform our conception of childhood on a scale of one to five? Now, you only have to do that thought experiment to realize the absurdity of it. Because printing did all of those things and much more. But nobody in Mainz in 1473 had the faintest idea that that would happen. Right. Why pick 1473? Because when I was writing the book, we were the same distance into the web. OK. The point, I, the moral I draw from that story is nobody actually has a clue where this stuff will, will end up. Nobody. And it's kind of foolish to pretend that we do. We can make guesses and we can have hypotheses and so on and so forth, but actually we have not a clue. 
And it would be, I think it would be the beginning of wisdom if we started to think like that. So that was, that was the first big idea. Second big idea is not a big idea at all because I don't have to tell anybody in this room, I hope, that it's... But you have to, people have to understand that the web is not the internet. Why was that important? Because I was astonished as I went around talking to people. I've lectured and talked and written about this stuff for 15 years. And so in my time, I have talked to a lot of people, well-informed, uh, uh, senior, sometimes ranging from government ministers, uh, senior civil servants, uh, captains of industry, uh, vice chancellors, you name it. The great and the good of our society. I've talked to them about this stuff. And one thing that really astonished me was how many of them use the term web and internet interchangeably. And in fact, as you know, that's an enormous misconception. Uh, a few months ago, I was at a Royal Society seminar, or a symposium run by Tim Berners-Lee, the guy who invented the web. And I, I mentioned to him this, um, this discovery I'd made about how many people uh, thought that the, the web was the internet. And he smiled that enigmatic smile he's got, and he said, might be even worse than that, he said. There are probably several hundred million people in the world today who think that Facebook is the internet. Okay, and so on and go on. And I have to tell, as, you, as I, I hope I don't have to tell you, that's the biggest misconception you can have. Because it's making, uh, it's making, uh, it's failing to understand the distinction between the infrastructure on which things happen, which is the internet, and the traffic that runs on it. If you wanted to think about it in a simple metaphor, use a railway one. The tracks and the signalling are the infrastructure of a railway network on which all kinds of different traffic runs. Uh, good trains, fast trains, slow trains, trains that don't work like my one this morning, and so on. But the point is that there's a distinction between the, the infrastructure and the stuff that runs on it. And in relation to the internet, although the web is enormous and really important and so on, it is actually, first of all, not the only thing that runs on the internet and sometimes not the most important thing. If you look at data traffic across the net sometimes, depending on the time of day, you'll find that web traffic, HTTP traffic, is, is swamped by other things. Okay? So, now, that's the first thing you have to understand. But the really key to this is that if you don't, if you don't understand that the thing that really matters is the internet, uh, then you are not in a position to understand anything about it, really. And the reason is simple. It is that it has a special property as a network. And in, in programming language, this is the way you'd put it, that for the internet, for this network, disrupt, disruptive innovation, disruption, is a feature, not a bug. In other words, the fact that the internet is proving so disruptive to our economies, to our social life, to our politics, and all the kinds of other things, is no accident. It's, it's an outcome of the architecture that was built into the system from the beginning. This architecture had two basic underlying principles. The first is that there was no, over, no overall control or ownership. Nobody owns or controls the internet as an entity. And the other thing was, the other, the other principle was that the network should not be optimized for any particular application. So there are various ways of, dis, of, of describing this that emerged later. Um, for example, stupid network, um, smart applications, um, the end-to-end -end principle, um, net neutrality, all this kind of stuff. But basically, what, what, what the people who, who designed the internet uh, decided was that they would, do, they would build an internet, that they would build a network which did only one thing. It took in data packets from one end and tried to deliver them to their destination at the other end, and it did nothing else. It was completely agnostic about what was in those data packets. There could be bits of email, there could be bits of pornographic video, there could be music tracks, there could be anything. The internet didn't care. If you, if you were smart enough to do something with data, um, with, with data packets, then the internet would do it for you, no questions asked. And because you, it wasn't owned and controlled by anybody, if you had a really good idea, and it could be done in data packets, you could do it because nobody could stop you. And what, so in, in effect what happened was that we, we invented without, I don't think, really realizing it, or the people who built this system, Vince Cerf and, and Bob Kahn and the others, what they created was actually a global machine for springing surprises. They said, we're going to have a simple network and we leave all the ingenuity to the outside, to the applications that people want to do with it. And it's, it's none of our responsibility. That's all we do. And then what happened was an explosion of creativity. 
a generation of, of colossal surprises that nobody expected. The first of these surprises, I would say, and the biggest, was the web. You know the history of the internet, of the web, I, I, I take it, but, but if you don't, a, a potted version of it is that you have this British physicist, Tim Berners-Lee, he's working in, a, in, in, in CERN, the big particle research lab, in the late 1980s. Uh, he has an idea for how to, how to um, store and access uh, documents distributed across the net. Uh, he goes to his boss in CERN and he says, I have this idea. Um, and he, he writes a little paper about it. His, his boss scribbles on the cover of the paper, vague but interesting. Um, and, he, and eventually Tim, who's persistent, said, well, can I have, can I have two, two, two fancy workstations and six months to work on this? And Mike said, okay, okay, okay. Go for it. And, and in less than a year, Tim Berners-Lee and a very small number of people invented everything we've got on the web. The whole thing from scratch. And then because CERN wasn't particularly interested in it and nobody else seemed to be interested in it, in 1991, they put the code for the whole thing onto the CERN internet server. Right? They didn't ask anybody's permission except for the permission of the boss to work on the thing. They didn't ask, they didn't say we were going to do this, they didn't say we were, we were going to release something that's going to upend the publishing models of, of the whole world and so on and so forth. They just did it. Okay? And it came as a fantastic surprise. Okay. Now, today, nobody knows how big, the, how big the web is. We know it's colossal. We know that everybody in this room couldn't live without it. It has transformed the way we work, the way we live, and the rest of it. But it all stems from this bit of permissionless innovation that happened in the late 1980s in CERN. Okay. That's, that's an example of this surprise generation machine. Another surprise. Ten years later, there's a disaffected teenager called Sean Fanning in the United States. He's been kicked out of school, and he's bad news generally, but he actually is very clever, and, and he can program. Sean Fanning is a music nut. He knows that across the internet, there are colossal collections of music, digital, digitized music, there were then. But of course, they're very hard to find, they're very hard to locate, and they're very hard to share. So he locks himself in his bedroom, and in six months, he writes the code for a file sharing system called Napster. And then without telling anybody, and without sharing, seeking anybody's permission, he just launches it. So he puts it on the... On the, on the internet, and the internet does its thing. It doesn't care what's in those data packets. It doesn't care how Napster works. It does use the data packets, so it'll do it. You know the rest of the story. Napster goes from zero to 60, maybe 80 million users uh, in, a, in a blink of an eye. Uh, there came a moment when almost everything that had ever been recorded was freely available online. Almost everything. The, somebody called it the Celestial Jukebox. Okay. Um, the, the, all the stuff was, of course, the problem was that most of it was, was copyrighted, and, and most of the sharing was illicit, and so on and so forth. But you can believe me, this was a surprise. And of course, it was a very big surprise to the music business. And they haven't recovered from it since. OK, the last example. This is another example of the, of the surprise generation machine, which is what you really have to understand about this network, if you want to understand. It's not something that's wrong with it. It's what it was designed to do. Last one is Facebook. Uh, how many people have seen the social network film? Okay, well, most of you know the story then. There's this, there's this mad, dysfunctional, very clever kid uh, writes a, a ridiculous uh, uh, application called FaceMash, which he puts onto the Harvard network. Um, and in, in, in a few hours, he has 20, the, the little site he has gets 20, 22,000 hits, and the, the, the Harvard network administrators hold out of bed, and the site is taken down, and, and Zuckerberg is dragged through the courts of Harvard and so on and so forth, okay? Um, and then a few months later, he, has, he, takes, he takes the Winklevoss's idea and he, he implements it, okay? But next time, he doesn't put it in the Harvard network. He borrows $1,000 from his friend Eduardo Severino. He rents a web hosting facility and he puts Facebook onto the internet. Now, note, he didn't ask anybody's permission and there's nobody to take it down. Now, you know what happens next, don't you? That in terms of population, Facebook is now the third biggest country in the world. Okay. And all of that happened because this engine, this, this surprise generation machine does it. And that's the really significant thing about it. And it's the thing that's often most misunderstood about the net, in my opinion. Um, it seemed to me, thinking about it, that we needed new intellectual frameworks for, uh, for thinking about this. And of course, One's hesitant to say that in, in such a distinguished 
uh, institution as the LSE, that there might be perhaps times when economics was not as useful as some of its um, students and proponents think. But my, my, my feeling was that, that one of the reasons why we struggled with this in order to try and find an intellectual framework is that the kind of economic analysis that we normally use for thinking about things um, doesn't, really, doesn't really work in this case. Because um, economics is ultimately about how scarce resources are allocated. And the thing that characterizes our digital ecosystem, whatever else it is, it, it ain't scarcity. It's abundance. And so the question was, do, can we find an intellectual framework that would help us think about abundance. And as it happens, there is such a framework that exists. Uh, it comes from the natural sciences. It's called ecology. It's the study of natural systems, where abundance, abundance and diversity are the hallmarks uh, and, and dynamic change and all the rest of the hallmarks of it. So one of the things I, I've, I've, I've thought from the beginning is that you have to think about some of this stuff in ecological terms. So for example, if you're thinking about, say, the WikiLeaks phenomenon, uh, about which um, uh, Charlie Beckett and James Ball have written a really good book, by the way, which has come, come, just come out. Um, what's interesting about WikiLeaks, for example, is the way in which um, it, for a time, um, evolved a kind of symbiotic relationship with some of the conventional media that um, it, it appeared at sometimes to challenge and to displace. That was the period over the cable gates revelations and so on. But everywhere you look, whether it's blogging and, and mainstream media and all the rest of it, what you see are the kinds of symbiotic um, Evolution, the evolution of symbiotic relationships and other things that actually are dead familiar to ecologists but look very strange to economists. So my, my feeling is that we need a different intellectual framework. The fifth idea is that the new emerging digital networked ecosystem that we've got uh, with the internet at its core uh, is, is a completely different media ecosystem from the kinds we've had before in, in one respect. That is to say, it's orders of magnitude more complex than anything that went before. Orders of magnitude. On any metrics that you, metric that you care to use, whether it is the number of publishers, for example, the number of authors and publishers, or whether it is the density of interactions between them, or the speed of change. Um, in all of those metrics and others, what you have is an environment which is immeasurably more complex than the media environments you had to cope with before. That's easy to say. But actually, I think it has quite profound implications. Um, and it explains why we are having, or why our institutions are having such great difficulty in coping with what they now have to deal with. And the reason for that is that if you're an engineer like I am, you know, you know that there are some basic sort, of, uh, basic sort of laws that apply to this stuff. For example, in cybernetics, there's um, Ross Ashby's famous law of requisite variety, in other words, which says that a system can't be viable unless it, can, it finds a way of handling the complexity of its environment. And it, we've always, human beings have always hated complexity, and human institutions have always detested it. And in general, they have coped in, in the past either by trying to reduce the complexity of the environment that they have to deal with, or by somehow managing it. Mass production is a very good example of how to deal with complexity. Okay? Uh, in the case of, of universities, um, they have dealt with it by, by ruthlessly suppressing the possibilities for complexity, by forcing students to behave in certain ways, by forcing them through certain kinds of degree patterns, and so on, by implementing a kind of orderly structure, forcing an orderly structure on this, on, on this kind of complexity. And they could do that for a long time. They're having increasing difficulty because, um, because the complexity is now such, and the speed of change that is implicit in that complexity and so on is such that it's very difficult to manage. And my feeling is that that's at the root of a lot of the angst that you see corporate and organizational and governmental uh, about this. We, we're not good with complexity. And what's more, we don't even use the theoretical tools that complexity scientists and others are now coming up with in order to understand it. We're kind of like, um, like blind men grappling with some kind of elephant. Um, and, uh, um, and, and I think that's, that's going to be kind of quite serious in the long run. Um, for example, what, if you have a really complex, fast-changing environment, uh, probably the worst thing you can do as an organization is have a strategy. But guess what I see everywhere? I see strategic plans. I also see dustbins filling up with them regularly, but they do it all the time anyway. 
and so on. I don't think there's a major institution, there isn't a major company, there isn't a major organisation in the world which doesn't think it needs to have a strategic plan. Okay? And actually, the truth of the matter is that if you think about this like a cybernetician or a complexity scientist, you say, well, actually, that's the worst thing you could be doing. But that, doesn't, that message hasn't filtered through yet. Sixth idea. The, we've moved from a world where, once upon a time, a computer was the PC on your desk. And what happened, more or less, kind of uh, in, in, a, in a unobtrusive way, but it happened inexorably, was that that has changed as we moved uh, from, from that position to something where actually somewhere else there are computers that we use and the network is the thing that enables us to use them. Um, and um, for example, uh, how many people here use something like Hotmail or Google Mail? Okay, well, for each of you, the network is now your computer because nothing that happens on, on Hotmail or, or Webmail, actually nothing happens on your computer at all. Your computer is, is basically a life support system for the browser that enables you to access the computing resources somewhere else. And, and so on across, across the world. Now, wh where that leads to, in the end, is, is what's now known as cloud computing. And that, at the moment, looks to be where, where everybody is heading. Um, it's a perfectly understandable kind of development for, 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 some, for many reasons, but it has really sobering implications in terms of uh, environmental impact, in terms of security, in terms of privacy, in terms of robustness, and in terms of dependence that I don't think are having grown up, we're having just grown up discussions about. Uh, cloud computing is kind of a nice cliche, but boy does it have really serious implications. And they're not being discussed much. Seventh, people I encountered when I was when, when I was doing the, 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 the conversations and the lecturing and the consulting and so on that, went, that preceded this book, was they had this kind of idea that the web was a fixed thing. Um, and they thought of it as a fixed thing rather like it was when it emerged from Tim Berners-Lee's first ideas, i.e. as a kind of publication platform of static things and the rest of it. And it was once that. It was a one-way static platform and the rest of it. And, and it's not that anymore. And again, just going back to those of you who use webmail, Gmail or Hotmail, the rest of it, when you hook into your, uh, hot, to your, to your uh, webmail account, um, you get a web page. That's your Google Mail or your Hotmail, and the rest of it. Um, and then you can spend the whole day inside that page because you don't go anywhere else if you're using that mail. That's, you're just there. That's what, but what you don't, what many people don't realize if they're not technical, is that actually what's happened is you haven't got a web page. You've got a web page from, from, from Google. But actually what you've got is a web page which buried inside it in a way you can't see is actually a small little computer. And that does, it's, it's, it, that's using Ajax, the technology that uh, asynchronous JavaScript, um, which, which um, is doing a lot of computing within that page all the time. Um, and uh, that's, that's, that's an example of, of the way the web has changed. Um, if you want to look at it like a geologist would, you, you can see that the web has had several geological eras already, starting with Web 1.0, which was Tim Berners-Lee, original read-only publication, Static Pages Web. Web 2.0, which is a kind of a cliche for a lot of different things, but that includes Facebook, it includes uh, Google Maps, it includes lots of other sort of stuff. And in the, in the, in the near, distant, near, near future, something which people will eventually start calling Web 3.0, uh, which will be perhaps a uh, web which, which, which deals with, uh, with data a lot and which also uh, has some element of semantic uh, technology built into web pages so that machine intelligence can do, make intelligent, more intelligent inferences about the content of pages so it can distinguish the movie Casablanca from the city Casablanca and so on. But uh, we're not there yet and nobody knows what it will be like when we get there much, but we have ideas. But the point I'm trying to make is that the web is not static. It's changing very rapidly and has always changed and evolved and morphed. The eighth idea is that our intellectual property regime no longer makes any sense. Um, there's no way around that. And the reason for that is is really simple. Digital technology uh, does copying. 
That's what it does. The way computers work is they make copies of things and they transfer them from one place to the next. When you, when you, when you look at the LSE web page, what happens is that the server that's hosting the page sends you down all the components of, of the page, sends them down the web, to your, down the internet to your, to your machine. And what then happens at your end is that your browser um, receives all this stuff, makes it into a perfect copy which is placed in the video RAM of your machine and then displayed. You can't display it without copying it. Okay. So copying to digital technology is like breathing is to organic life. That's the way it works. That's the way the technology works. Now, not only that, but um, digital copying is different from the kind of copying we did before, analog copying. With analog copying, it was expensive, degenerative, uh, difficult and hard to disseminate. Okay. Uh, if, you, if you make a photocopy of a page, and then you make a photocopy of the photocopy, and then you make, by the time you get to the 100th photocopy, believe me, you've got a mess, because okay, it's degenerative. Same for audio, same for everything else. But with digital technology, the copying is either perfect or, or not at all. It either works perfectly or doesn't work at all. So making a perfect copies of anything that can be expressed as a bit stream is a trivial and easy and cheap process. Okay? That's, that's, the in, in, that's the intrinsic affordance of the technology. Okay? But we happen to have intellectual property laws which ha were framed in an era when copying was difficult, degenerative, expensive, and hard to distribute. And we're saying we can apply this, these laws to this new environment. And the answer is, we can't. Every, lots of people are in denial about that and the rest of it, but actually, it ain't going to work. And a big question is, so what do we do? And we're nowhere near even an intelligent argument about that yet. Um, but I think we were going to need one. And finally, um, in thinking about where we might be heading, uh, I borrowed an idea I got many years ago from Neil Postman, wonderful writer about this stuff, cultural critic. Um, and he, he, he put forth the idea that our futures are, our, our possible futures are kind of bookmarked by the visions of two great British writers, George Orwell and Aldous Huxley. Um, why choose them? Well, uh, Orwell thought we'd be destroyed by the things we fear. And Huxley thought that our undoing would be the things that delight us. And in relation to the net, we have some very good plausible arguments for both visions or both nightmares. In, in the Orwellian sense, the, the internet is a perfect surveillance machine because everything you do on this network, but everything is logged and tracked. Everything. If you're a very, very sophisticated techie and you're instant in cryptography and so on, you can do so much. But broadly speaking, everything that happens on the net, it's a perfect surveillance machine. And if Orwell were alive today, he'd have said, well, that makes my telly screen look like a village vicarage party, tea party. On the other end of the extreme, the, the Huxley end, um, Huxley thought it was much easier to control people. It would be much easier to control people by delighting them rather than by frightening them, um, which is why his, his uh, Brave New World was, was predicated on, on the, a population that was kept basically a, a passive by by various methods of social control, including this wonderful drug, Soma, which was a better narcotic than anything we've ever come across before, and so on. Um, and in thinking about that, uh, strangely enough, the, what came to my mind was uh, the late lamented Steve Jobs. Uh, how many people here have iPhones? Right. How many people here have iPads? Uh, yeah. How many people here have Apple computers. Right. And I'm willing to bet that most of you are pretty pleased and delighted with your devices. Okay. And so you should be. They're lovely pieces of work. Absolutely wonderful devices. So, um, but you know that your iPhone is not yours. Because an invisible string stretches from it all the way to number one infinity loop Cupertino, which is where Apple's headquarters are. Nothing goes on your iPhone. Nothing goes on your iPad. Nothing goes on your iPad that Apple hasn't cleared and approved. Okay? 
Now, that's an interesting form of control. And it shows that the Huxleyan vision, Huxleyan nightmare, is also not inconceivable. Um, so my feeling is that when you think about a network future, then these, the insights of these two writers are really relevant. The trouble with Neil Postman's, when he, when he, when he thought about this idea many years ago, he thought it would be one or the other. And the true nightmare, I think, in relation to this stuff is that it might be both. Because governments have tooled up on the Orwellian side really big time. And Facebook and co, and Google, and Apple have tooled up really nicely on the other side. Okay. So they're the ideas in the, in the book. Um, a few reflections on those ideas. Um, and then I'll stop, and I'd like to take questions. Um, the first thing is the long view idea. I, I think that bears really serious thinking about. Because, uh, first of all, the minute you start asking yourself, what did print do? Well, it had enormous implications. The ramifications of print are indescribably wide and broad and, and deep. Um, it changed our society, it shaped our society for 400 years in all kinds of ways. Um, but interestingly, it also changed us. And that's the bit that I hadn't thought about until I started writing this book. Because um, what we now know about, for example, neurophysiology uh, is, is that our human, the human, bra human brain is, fun, is actually a very plastic um, uh, organism. Um, and because, because reading is not, um, uh, is, is not innate, it's a learned skill, we discovered that learning skills changes the structure of your brain. And if you look at the, the brain structure of people who are illiterate, for example, it's, they're different from the brain structure of people who can read. Um, so, so as well as changing our society, actually it turned out that print also changed us. Um, long arguments about that and the rest of it, but, but there's a wonderful book by Marianne Wolfe uh, about the impact of, of reading on our brains, for example, and so on. Now, spool forward. Okay, if that's true for print, then the question, of course, is, well, it's probably true for us now, too, in relation to our new dominant uh, communication technology. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a foregone conclusion that, that for people who are uh, intensive users of, of this technology, then we will find, we will find that it, has, it impacts their brain structures, it impacts all kinds of other things as well. And that lies behind, for example, the amazing uh, 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 leverage that, that a commentator called Nick Carr got from an article he wrote in The Atlantic with the title is Google Making Us Stupid, which he then expanded into a book entitled The Shallows. But, but essentially, he was, he was beginning to speculate about, about this. And I think that's a reasonable speculation, given what we know from print. Now, another thing about taking the long view is you may have observed that uh, the, the, the angst that this technology uh, causes in established industries like, like my, my... I've written a newspaper column since 1982, I think, so I have a foot in both graves, so to speak. Um, and, and you know that, you know that, um, that the, the internet and the, and the web in particular appears to be having a devastating impact on, on, on print culture and print publishing and all the rest of it. Um, and that nobody can find a business model that will work in the, new, in the new environment and the rest of it. And again, that's true. But actually, it really helps to think about this in a historical context. Because way back in 1920, when radio first appeared, broadcast radio first appeared, Remember, radio, radio was a, a, a few-to-many uh, broadcast technology. Um, nobody had the faintest idea how to make money, how to find a business model that would support radio broadcasting. And it took the best part of 15 years and an awful lot of bankruptcies to figure out a, a business model for radio. And as it happens, it, the, the, the business model was not figured out by any of the radio people. It was figured out by Procter & Gamble, a soap company. Which, which came up with the idea, if you, if you sponsored compulsive dramatic content on radio and you associated your brand with it, then that would really do you a lot of good. And that's where the soap opera came from and the rest of it. But the point I want to make is that if you were to go back to the United States in the early 1920s and, and you'd hear an awful lot of people tearing their hair out, like you hear newspaper editors tearing their hair out here and newspaper proprietors and magazine owners and so on and broadcasters saying, Christ almighty, what's going to happen to us? Well, actually... How can we make money from this thing? How can we find a business model that would support us in the future and so on and so forth? Same story in the 1920s in, in the US. Um, so it really helps sometimes, I think, to take the long view of this stuff. Second reflection I've got since I've finished the book was 
how wise old Joe Schumpeter was. You know Joe, I think, maybe? Uh, Austro-American economist, I think he was a professor at Harvard for a long time, well-known boulevardier, womanizer, and polymath. But he had this idea that capitalism renewed itself in 25-year uh, cycles of what he called creative destruction. And my hunch is that we are in the middle of one of those waves of creative destruction. And the thing that sometimes annoys me about this when Schumpeter's name is, is, is brought up is that um, the thing has two dimensions. The wave is creative in the sense that it makes possible, brings into being things that were unthinkable before, some things, sometimes things that are wonderful, say the web. Okay. Um, so it is creative, no question about it. But it is also destructive in the sense that it destroys things that may have value. Uh, it is possible, for example, that, uh, that, that this technology will wipe out newspapers. And in some cases, not all, that would be a sad event. I'd be very sorry to lose the New York Times or the Observer, the Guardian, for which I write, uh, or, or, but I wouldn't weep any tears over the sun, say, or especially you know, the Daily Mail. I might dance on its grave. But, 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 but the point is that but the, but some people would, would miss the mail. Okay? But the, the point is that there is a destructive edge to this stuff as well. And our narrative about it, our public discourse about it, in my view, doesn't reflect those, th th that kind of complexity of the, that spectrum. Um, so you have people who, think, who see, focus only on the creative side of it, and you see people who focus only on the destructive side of it. And that's kind of pathetic. We need a more grown-up discourse about it. Um, this, is, this is for people like me. Um, because once upon a time, when this network first appeared, many of us, especially engineers, we were utopians about this. I, we really thought that this would, this would really change the world, would really change society, and so on. Um, and uh, that found its greatest expression in a famous Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace by John Perry Barlow, which some of you no doubt have read. And if you haven't, it's a wonderful example of, of kind of uh, inspiring hot air. Um, I, I once shared a platform with John Perry Barlow, and I wouldn't recommend it as an experience because uh, I, he and I were the two speakers, and we were allocated two hours, and I got five minutes. <laughs> but so, but uh, he's a wonderful guy. He's fun, he, he was the lyricist for the Grateful Dead. Um, he's been a great libertarian all his life. Uh, he was one of the founders of the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the rest of it. He's a great guy. And this kind of techno utopianism actually runs deep in those of us who are engineers. We really did think that this stuff, that this network, this invention, was a truly revolutionary one. Um, and once I was at a, s a symposium in Seattle um, with some of these distinguished people, like Manuel Castells, like, like John Perry Barlow, like Vince Cerf, who was one of the architects of the internet, and so on. And there was much talk about how revolutionary this technology would be. But also at that um, symposium was an old friend of mine, um, a very distinguished uh, elderly scholar, uh, an extremely learned and wise man, uh, who also happened to be a cigar smoker, like me. And at one point, he, he, he said to me, um, could we have a cigar? And so we left this raging ferment of utopian discussion and we went outside and we sat on the deck looking down at the Puget Sound and we smoked cigars. And eventually he said to me, do you think, do you really think that this technology is as revolutionary as those people think? And I said, well, yeah, yes, I do. Yeah, I do. Because I did. And he didn't reply. Um, and after a while, his silence bothered me. And I said, what do you think, James? And he said, we'll see, dear boy. We'll see. And I think that was pretty smart. <laughs> How do we get this? <laughs> I mean, I like the sound of my own voice, but this is ridiculous. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> Thank you. Well, there you go. Um, two for the press of one. Um, I w this is about intellectual property. Um, I said to you that I, I, I think it's crazy to assume that an intellectual, an intellectual property regime that was framed for a distant era could be applied to a, a completely uh, different one. And what that brought to my mind was uh, the famous um, story about the Cosby brothers, whom Conrad probably knows because he's a lawyer, but, but maybe others do as well. The Cosby brothers were chicken farmers in the United States. And in 1946, they were, they were very bothered by the fact that military training flights, which overflew their farm, frightened their chickens. And the chickens would fly into the wall and kill themselves, apparently. So they, they, they sued the government. And, um, and because it was actually a very important case, it went very quickly to the Supreme Court and was decided in May 1946. But the, the grounds, for the, for the, the grounds for, the, for the Cosby's case was that uh, property law said at the time that if you owned a piece, of, a piece of land, then you owned everything that extended below to the Earth's core and everything to the heavens above. Okay? And here were these planes from the government flying through the, the bit that extended to the heavens above and they were killing their chickens. Okay? Yeah, that seems to be the basis of the case. It, it went to the Supreme Court, I think, because it must have been very, very important. And it was decided by a majority of five to two that that doctrine about the ownership of property extending to the heavens couldn't be sustained. But the thing that struck me, and the one I quoted in the book, is, is, the, judge by, is the judgment by, William, uh, by Justice William Douglas. He said, this doctrine has no place in the modern world. The air is a public highway, as Congress had declared. Were that not true, every transcontinental flight would subject the operator to countless trespass suits. Common sense revolts at the idea. To recognize such private claims to the airspace would clog these highways, seriously interfere with their control and development in the public interest, and transfer into private ownership that to which only the public has a just claim. Okay. The phrase that leapt out at me was, common sense revolts at the idea. So when I look at, for example, the legislation that's proposed uh, in the United States Congress, the SOPA and uh, PIPA Acts uh, bills, or at the Three Strikes Act that's going through the uh, various parliaments at the moment in, in Europe and so on, what, what I think of is that this is mad. This does common sense revolt at this stuff. This is, you can't do it this way. It just, just, it just doesn't make any sense, and we have to think again. Um, and the other thing we have to think of is the lessons of prohibition. Because um, some of the, the more, more stringent kind of views about intellectual property, if actually implemented by our lawmakers in, on the internet, would turn every teenage child in this country into a criminal. And their parents, in some cases. And in the end, you can't run a society on that basis. We have to think again. Um, and the lesson of pro prohibition, of course, is obvious, which is that they tried it in the United States. Uh, they tried banning alcohol for, was it 13 years? And I don't need to tell you what the outcome was. An utter disaster, the growth of organized crime, the criminalization of uh, millions of Americans, and so on and so forth. It just doesn't work. Uh, we don't know how to deal with complexity, period. I, I don't need to have, have that one. And I think that this, the struggle for control of this, this, this network is going to intensify. And the big question for me is whether our democracies can ensure that it has a democratic outcome. And I'm pessimistic about that. I'll end there. Any questions? Ma'am. I shot my hand up because I have to leave. Um, oh, okay. I just want to say thank you so much for a really thank you. fascinating talk. Um, I, I just have a question for you about um, coming to this as a writer and journalist as well, have a deep yeah. concern for the shock therapy that traditional publishing is undergoing right now. And I was trying to sort of frame a question, which is the question that troubles me, and I wonder that the internet is kind of generated with problems, and one of the problems it seems to generate in its levelling capacity by making all information free, because then, then it creates the problem, yes, but not all information has the same value. Yep. So this is, a, this is clearly to be a huge problem, and I wonder if you'd say a little bit more about that. And the other thing I wanted to tell you <laughs> is that I think George Orwell has a short story about delighting us into dystopia. Oh wow! Okay. And, and it's in the it's in a book written in the 90s by Marcus Luca, 
Well, I didn't know this. an early commentator on Thank you. Yeah. And um, he goes into the story in detail that where Orwell has envisaged everybody electronically wired up in little modular cells like a honeycomb. Yep. Nobody interacting with anyone else. Yeah. Thank, well, thank you for that. Can I go back to your first question? Yeah, yeah, um, the, 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 first of all, the, there's an element of, of the Schumpeterian destructive uh, sort of perspective on that. I see that. Um, and um, I, I think that, again, it comes back to this historical view. I don't think that, first of all, information can't be free, full stop. No, that's not a viable idea either. Um, but we're very early into this stuff at the moment. And because it has been traditionally in the last few years, people have put everything up and the rest of it, of course, it's been taken. And because it can be taken, it will be taken, the rest of it. But essentially, we can't go on like that. And we won't go on like that. But, but, but I think the reason, the, the, the essence, the, the, the key thing to, to sort of making progress on this is to, is to build some kind of informed public consent. In, in a reasonable way of doing it. And I have to tell you that I think the, American, the framers of the American Constitution got it about right, um, which is that you need a reasonable period of copyright protection. And for that, you will get public support. You won't get public support for the grotesquely extended, obscenely extended copyright. That's the first thing. Um, the, the second thing is that um, uh, I wonder whether, whether the people who are who are worried about, about, about what's happening in relation to print publishing, for example, are they, conform, are, are they confusing form with, with function? For example, in the newspaper business, people are obsessed with how to preserve the newspaper. I think there's a crisis over content, personally. Well, it's just, I think it's a crisis over function. In the newspaper business, it's easy. What, 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 what does society need? Answer, it needs good, high-quality, objective, truth-telling journalism. That's the function. Um, the, the newspaper is one historically accidental way of doing that. But the, to focus on the, on the preservation of the newspaper, the printed newspaper, is to miss the real story. I think the same is true for books, by the way. Because what, what's important is not to preserve print publishers. What's important is to preserve some way that creative people can express themselves in, in texts, which can be available in all kinds of ways. But that's not what we talk about much. We talk about print at the moment. And, you know, if you look at, for example, so that, that's, and we're only, we're only, we're very, we're not long into that argument yet. That's why I think you have to take a deep breath and say this is going to last. Now, the problem is that in the long run, we're all dead. So if we have to wait for the long run, some of us are going to miss it, but there you go. Um, anyway, thank you for, and thank you for the oral suggestion. I haven't known that. Yep. Well, first of all, I agree with, I, I, I share all of those um, views. And, um, but this is an old story, in a sense, because there's a wonderful article by Eli Noam, which was published in the 1995, in the 1995 issue of Science Journal. And the title of the article was Electronics and the Dim Future of the University. And in it, Noam said, um, up to now, we, uh, Universities functioned on the principle that um, the knowledge was located in the university, whether in, in the heads of people who taught and researched in the universities, or, or the resources that that university had, the libraries and the rest of it. And scholars and students had to come to the resource. 
Um, but there, there will come a time when they won't have to come because the resources will be available to anybody anywhere. Where's the Library of Congress when it's on my laptop was a famous question by Howard Reinhold in the 80s. Um, and I think that's, that's true. So, so Noam, Noam was basically saying in that 1995 article, there may be things that are important uh, that universities do that they're not talking about. For example, maybe there is a rationale for gathering large numbers of young people at the same time in their lives in the same geographical location. Okay, maybe there is. And maybe that's what universities really are about at a time when all the resources and the rest of it are easily accessible from elsewhere. Um, I don't honestly think that the university sector has yet formulated a really good argument in, in, in dealing with this sort of stuff, which is why I think that in relation to complexity, for example, we really are in trouble. But, but there is a difficulty with that, which is that um, some of us have been saying that for, for a while and not much has happened yet. LSE is still in rude health. Um, it's forcing students to come and, and so on, the rest of it. On the other hand, you know, I noticed in Cambridge, um, for example, that uh, I would say that um, a, a vanishingly small number of science and technology students, and Cambridge is a big science and technology university, ever cross the threshold of the library. Um, and I don't expect that to change. Um, so the, uh, the thing about institutional adaptation and change for universities is at least as urgent and as real as it is for, for the, well, perhaps it's less urgent than real, but it is, it is like the, the thing that faces other organisations like, like print publishers and so on. And I, I don't see enough of discourse about that at the moment. Um, Connor. If I did a special deal with the Law Society and got the agreement that my six key subjects were sort of certified as sufficient for the qualifying as a barrister sister, I could get my six dates, I could put it on the web, and then it would be a degree, and that would go with the grain of current government policy to commercialize the university yep. sector. So it might be even bigger than you mentioned. But I have a question, John, yep. which is picking up your very first remark and asking you about whether I need to know how the stuff works. Now, I know I would need to know about it if I wrote about it. I know I would need to know about it if my thing is human rights and civil liberties, if I wanted to do a kind of critique of democratic implications of the net. But supposing it's neither of those two, it's a third. I have limited capacity in my head, and yeah. I want to communicate certain ideas I have about my subject. Yeah. I have a bunch of people around me yeah. who are really good at fixing it and telling me what to do. Yeah. And my principle throughout, I've got a website, I'm on the Twitter thing, mm. I've done a book on the web, is I do not want to know how this works. Mm. I know the guy who knows. Mm -hmm. Now, am I being a little bit like Sherlock Holmes who didn't know that the planets went round the sun because he didn't need to know it? Or do I need also to know what was going on when you and Steve and the various of you, reminded me of CIT show, were all around the computer trying to get it work? I mean, how much of that do I need to know in that third realm? Okay, I think it depends on, uh, the, the answer depends on, 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 on what uh, you, you need to be doing at a particular time. For example, it's a bit like, the, people say this all the time, I don't understand how my car works, but that's okay, I can drive it, okay. Um, for, for all the uses you described, that's a perfectly reasonable attitude. Okay. However, if you're a citizen, and you're being bombarded with stuff about uh, anti-piracy legislation, okay, um, then you need, for example, the, 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 the SOPA bill, okay, and the rest of it. You need to know something more than that. You need to know that, that this, this is a very attractive idea of DNS blocking, blocking at the DNS level, which, is, which was part of the original SOPA bill and the Piper Act, Piper bill. You need to know that that, has, that, would, that would have fantastic levels of collateral damage, and therefore it's not in the public interest. Now, so at that point, you need to know something about it. Um, when, when the Regulation of Investigative Powers Act was going through Parliament in 1999, I was one of the people who contested it and, and tried to have it amended. Uh, and one of the things that astonished us um, was the cluelessness of MPs. Of the 635 MPs in the House of Commons at the time, I would guess only 20 had the faintest idea of what was going on. And most of them had, been, had bought the line sold them by the Home Office, which was basically the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act is perfectly straightforward. We're simply updating wiretapping regulations and other things for an internet age. 
Okay. So these poor MPs probably thought that, well, it's just a matter of, you know, it's like you, you put a tap on somebody's phone, well, you put a tap on somebody's email. Okay. What, what they didn't know was that actually there's almost no way of doing that without monitoring all the data traffic that goes through an ISP service. Okay. So in that case, they needed to know something more than goes on. It, it varies a bit, but, but I think that it goes back to my point about my fears about democratic control of this stuff, which is that there's no way of having democratic control of this of having, without having informed discourse about it. And most of the discourse we have at the moment is kind of uh, infantile. And it's infantile because most people don't know anything about it. And I worry about that because, I mean, I'm a professor of the public understanding of technology, so I, I would worry about it. But actually, I do think it's quite serious. I really do. Uh, but most of the time when you're driving your computer, you don't need to know how it works. Of course not. Um, but sooner or later, there'll come times when it's important for people to know. As a citizen, rather than necessarily as an academic. I, I think an informed citizenry is really the only way around this, and that's why I'm rather pessimistic. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Tim Berners-Lee talking about how some people, or potentially a large number of people, the internet is Facebook. Um, I've called, heard Facebook call the uh, so-called wall guard before. Can you talk a bit more about the, uh, the implications of the, the kind of Facebook wall guard? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I mean, wall gardens are the wet dreams of monopolists um, in the sense that um, that's what they all want. That's what AOL wanted uh, when, it, when it became a big force on the web. Um, that's what uh, Google wants. That's what Microsoft wanted. Um, and that's what Facebook wants. And the, the idea is that um, you can somehow, uh, if, you can, if you can provide enough diversion and enough attractive services and other things, you can keep the population within, within the bounds of what you can control and what you, what you can exploit for. And the, 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 the difficulty that they've all had with that so far is because of the openness of the, of the internet and the open architecture of the web that was built on this open architecture, you have something that's <laughs> literally full of surprises and that you can't stop, they can't stop people being attracted to. Um, but they'll continue to try. Uh, I think it would be a disaster if Facebook became... I mean, I think Facebook is a disaster anyway. Um, but, but, and a really dangerous, uh, you know, this, this, the, what, what people... I mean, the, going back to Connor's point for a minute, just um, in the case of Facebook, okay, um, it provides a, quote, free service, unquote, which 800 million people use de delightedly. 50% um, of them check into it every day, I think. Um, okay, what these people don't realise is that they are Facebook's product. If it's free, you are the product. Um, and the same is true for any, any bit of a wall garden. Uh, it's, it's either, if, if, it's, if it's charging, then that's, that's one of the rationales for wall gardening. If it's not, then, then somehow it's, it's selling or exploiting your identity. Um, and, but they haven't worked so far because the attractions of the open, wild, uh, surprise generation, uh, internet and web have been too great. But, uh, you know, who knows? Yeah, I mean, I think I worry about Facebook the way we once worried about Microsoft. And as it happened, you know, Microsoft, Microsoft faded um, and became kind of boring and middle-aged and, and very dull and not very adventurous and so on and, and not as dangerous as it used to be. Um, Facebook is the real danger now, I think. Uh, and that will change, probably, you know. Yep. Um, all of the major disruptive technologies seem to have got this as a business plan. Is that, is that a concern? Uh, yes, but it was a concern because people fall for it. <laughs> um, but, but, I mean, that's not to say that th these things wouldn't work if they didn't provide people with, with services that they value. You know, um, webmail is very useful. Um, and I, I think there's... there's I'm, I'm in favour I'm in favor of, of... What I'm in favour of is informed consent. Um, I think if people know what they're getting themselves into, then that's fine. 
um, and you can trade. So they trade their, they're basically implicitly trading their privacy for, for other things, or, or they're trading part of their identity and interests, in Google's case, for, for ads, for the ability to place ads, and so on. You get some very funny conjunctions of that, like, like a, an email from somebody ab about a dreadful stabbing incident, and then the ads for kitchen knives running down the, the side of the web page, and so on. But, but, um, but this is, uh, my, my, my worry about it at the moment is, is mainly to do with the fact that, as far as I can see, many people are getting into this without understanding what they're doing. I, I had a salutary experience at the weekend going through with somebody I know who's completely non-technical said she was very worried about the fact that she kept getting messages from Facebook that she hadn't asked, asked for. And I sat down with her and we went through her privacy settings. And it transpired she was wide open to the entire world and she didn't know that. Um, and and the, the reason she's wide open to the entire world is that all the default settings are that. If you control the default settings, you control 90% of the people. So, you know, that, that, but um, the only other business model that will work is where people pay for things. And do you, it, so do you think it's a problem then, I mean, it, it would have once been the case that in the course of a normal adult life, you would only see a serious legal document on a number of occasions, possibly when taking out a large bank loan, yep. getting a mortgage. Do you think that there's something about the simplicity of legal language now that on a given week, people sign up for countless new yeah. services. Yeah. We're bombarded with lengthy reams of terms and conditions every yeah. time Apple decides to update iTunes. Yeah. These things, by and large, do simply not get read. That's true. And, and people would be very shocked if they didn't read them. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing what these, the, what these uh, uh, end user license agreements um, actually, what, when you agree to them, what you're, what you're agreeing to. Um, but it's a bit like switching off cookies. If you, if you don't. If you don't agree to these terms, then you can't use the services you want. If you, if you don't want cookies deposited on your computer, then your web browser stops working. Or it takes 20 minutes to get to the, to the Guardian. You know? um, it's really, this is, this is very kind of tricky stuff. And then we have the European Union stirring the pot a bit with the right to forget and all that stuff too. So this is going to run and run. I think. Can I ask you, uh, you've referred a few times to increasing complexity. University context, you were talking about an increasing complexity of the student population. I may be wrong about that, but if that it was what you meant, in what way is the student population becoming more complex? Uh, well, I wasn't thinking that the, the population has become more complex, but the, the information environment in which they operate, in which students operate, is much more complex. And you can see it in, in interesting ways. For example, there's a wonderful guy, an anthropologist, which some of you, who some of you probably know, called Tim Wesh. Yeah, does that ring a bell? Okay. Michael West, is it Michael West? Okay. Well, um, he, he's done some wonderful stuff on YouTube with his students and so on. But, but um, he, he points out, for example, that um, uh, in, in most, most universities, um, teaching is still done in lecture theatres. Okay. Um, and the one thing, a lecture, so, so it's, it's done in an architecture which um, is actively hostile to discussion. Um, Whereas um, the, 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 the technologies that, that new generations of students are accustomed to, they expect, they have, been, they, have, they have expectations about teaching taking place in different kinds of ways, in more discussive ways or whatever. And the other thing is that um, there, there's a serious problem, which is that um, if, if you can get uh, on iTunes U or via the websites of MIT and Stanford and other places, um, if you can get... Um, amazing lecture courses given by uh, world famous world class scholars in their fields um, well you know why wh wh why would you sit through why would you sit through a lecture by somebody who 's kind of well meaning but not not top rank in your university and what does that mean in the longer term um, I, I, I would have said that that what what universities ought to be thinking about very hard is um, that the, the model that, that some uh, media commentators come up with, which is what you should do is do what you do best and link to the rest. Okay? So in each, in, each, in each institution's case, we have some core competencies, things we do really well. Uh, and I wish, should acknowledge that actually across the rest of the world, uh, people do the rest of it much better than we can do it. But we should be able to exploit that somehow using networking and other things, and do that honestly and openly and frankly and enthusiastically. And then we'll add value in some way too. But that's not what's happening in universities at the moment. They're not thinking like that. 
as far as I can see. John, I think we're going to have to draw it to a halt now. I did notice that, Ellen, you had your hand up earlier. It's OK, the question's Sorry, gone. So, but I'll send an email. <laughs> Come and talk to you afterwards. I'd like you all to join me in thanking John for what has been a really fascinating session and has given us a lot to think about. So, John, that was great.